Welcome. This is our time of worship here at Heinz Chapel, and wonderful to have everyone with us here this morning. And if you are visiting, and I don't think so because we are light on numbers this morning, but uh, for the visitors, I ask that you fill this out, or if you've got a prayer request, and we'll card there in front of you, drop it there in the offering plate, and don't forget to drop your offering and tithes in the offering plate back there. Uh, a little note, we begin by reading just as simply thank you uh, for the beautiful card and fruit basket. Uh, greatly appreciated and happy holidays, Wilbur Carter. And of course, we want to continue to remember him uh, during this time. Uh, as far as announcements, if you want to look on the inside of your bulletin, just a few things to point out. We will, as you can tell, uh, be taking communion today. And you don't have to fangle with those little plastic tops for the wafer in the cup. We're doing it going back to uh, the original way that you've done it. Uh, and it has been requested, and I'll say it now because I'm afraid I'll forget it later. The little cups, plastic cups that you send, take it, throw it in the back trash can there at the back door. They're sitting there, I think, by the offering plate. If you please do not mind. Uh, other things, of course, annual reports are due this week to Janice. Next Sunday is our annual meeting. We'll do that after worship. Uh, you see other upcoming uh, events that will be taking place, and I'll try and emphasize this, especially next week. Any uh, church committee, please choose your chairman. I'm trying to schedule the church council to meet on February 1st. That's a Tuesday, I believe. And so please, we're trying to roll, trying to get back to as close to normal, whatever that might be, as possible. And offering envelopes, I see a lot of you already picked yours up. If not, we're sitting there in the breezeway. Uh, already had this happen. If you don't see yours, let Martha know that it's missing. Don't take somebody else, okay? Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? Yeah. Yes. Speak to trustees after service. Yes. All right, trustees. Jerry would like to meet with you briefly after service. Anybody else? All right, if you look on the back, you'll see prayer needs. And uh, one that was brought to, uh, told to me, Brandy uh, was mentioning on the way in, a family friend. Name is Joanne Rice, uh, basically is in critical condition with COVID, very critical, blood clots and so forth. And so remember her, Joanne Rice. And she's in Lexington, you said? Lexington Hospital, so those three, remember her. Uh, others you see, uh, I noticed uh, Linda Emery, which is Jason Patterson's mother, is having surgery tomorrow. Uh, so you wanna remember that family. Uh, others, of course, it's always good to see uh, Dennis here and uh, Jimmy here. They're doing well. Continue to pray for them. Lift them up. Pray for everybody you see in this room, really, because we never know what might happen or what is going to, uh, what tomorrow holds. Uh, it is, and I just don't think I said this, Happy New Year. It is 2022. I always think of the New Year as a new beginning. I can forget all my mistakes from last year start over. Doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect, but I can start over. And God is a God of second chances. So any uh, updates, any praises, anybody you would like to add to our prayer list this morning? This Thursday? All right, Larry Coverson, who was uh, helping to sing the cantata, is having hernia surgery on Thursday. Tell uh, our friend Stevie Kipp of back surgery on Thursday. He's had several back surgeries. Good. Steve Hips, you'll remember him, sur back surgery tomorrow. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, can you continue to pray for the Graves family? Graves? Yeah, uh, Eddie finally can go for some of the heel surgery. And we're going to continue to look. Yes, that's right. We will remember the.
Graves family. He's passed on now. Others. this morning, but uh, you can, maybe you know where they're at, maybe you don't, just check on them, say hello, uh, just care about you, it's a new year, and we do need to take care of one another, so if there is no other, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Our gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come before you, we, we've mentioned a number of names here today and you know surgeries more surgeries on thursday a lot seems to be going on and for some people it's just not the way they want to start off the year but lord may we all start off our year with you we who are gathered here we who are, are going to tune in online we want to start off our year with you lord we, we want to take and to acknowledge you and to say lord god you you are our creator you are our sustainer and we want to Seek you. Seek your very face. We pray that 2022 will be a wonderful, blessed by you year. A lot better at least than the last two. We pray, Father, knowing you're the one who can remove this COVID virus from people. You're the one who can make changes, but you are also waiting on your people to come to you, to seek you, to follow you, to obey you, because we are your hands, your feet, Father. And so, Father, during this time, Speak to each and every one. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. May we leave here enthusiastic for you. So enthusiastic that our light is shining brighter and that people will see that light in this world, Lord, the light of Christ inside of each and every one of us. So here we are. Take us. Use us for your glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, so everybody stand. I promise it's okay. Stand. We're going to sing in a moment and greet those around you. Happy New Year. Good morning. Again, Happy New Year. So good to see everybody. Uh, if you would, we're going to sing the bond of love. The words are on the screen. We're going to do uh, verse one and two.
so much for all your prayers we need it and believe God is honored when his children come to him in worshipful dependence on his grace and goodness he is a good father and we give every good and perfect gift from above he gives every good and perfect gift from above on the Pompeo front which is the agency uh, most receiving this email of aware of Pompeo's operation fund deficit uh, in November, it was 50000 and this is dated December 12th. It has been a three-year decline. Thankfully, the remainder is only 38000 at this point. Uh, it's been a huge prayer burden over the past few months, and we're committed to trusting God to meet the need in the long term. So we need to continue uh, to remember uh, these mission agencies and missionaries who are supporting them, you know, we give what we, we uh, promise to give. Some churches stop or change or individuals, things happen. So continue to remember these agencies. Now, all the me, for the me, they're personal. Uh, they talk about Christ Church, which is a church plant. It says it's going well. These weeks, just before opening, is our first Sunday morning service of January 16th, are full of meetings, coordination of service teams, and physical stuff to make it happen. It's a bit different and more complicated than tribal church planning, but the steps are still the same. Thanks for your prayers. We love our supporters and prayer warriors. They're serving in Christ, Christ's grace for his glory through the church to all nations, David and Kathy B. So we want to continue to remember them. So a lot of prayers. I, I encourage you to go out here to the mission wall Write down uh, who we're praying for, our missionaries. Look at some of the sheets. I'll have this one out there by next Sunday. And just keep them in prayer. So.
2022. I'm sure we all have some questions about what this year is going to be like, right? Think back to two years ago, January, it was a pretty good year. Then March came, right? They all said, well, it'll be over with in a couple of months. We're fast approaching two years. Now, maybe, like a lot of people, for the new year, you made a New Year's resolution. Maybe it wasn't to catch COVID, I don't know. What I know is, I made a New Year's resolution years ago and I kept it. You know what that resolution was? To not make another New Year's resolution. <laughs> so a lot of people, they make them, but they don't keep them. Why is that? I'll give you two thoughts that I have. One, when they make the New Year's resolution, they're not paying close enough attention to what the resolution is. I mean, if you made a New Year's resolution, you're gonna lose 100 pounds this year, and you weigh like 250 or less, you're not gonna lose it, are you? Now, if you weigh 600 pounds, that's another story. Or, you don't pay close enough attention to the New Year's resolution, it's like you forgot. Oh, that's right. I'm supposed. To, I'm not supposed to eat candy for January, and, and you, you know, you, you already had some on your way in here today. So you, you broke your resolution. Well, what about with the Bible? Do you pay attention to what God's Word says? When you read it, are are you really paying attention? Or you just kind of skip over it. And I'll be honest. I, I've been reading through the Bible for years. I have a, a plan. You know, I'll, I'll find one or make one. And I'll follow it. And I'll finish it. And I'll go, what did I just read? Because I wasn't paying attention. And so as I thought about 2022. Now last year, my, my preaching focus was focus basically was bearing fruit for the Lord. Because that's what we're called to do, bear fruit for God. So I'm, God, what do you want for 2022? And so as I was reading, and I read here out of 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, that's where we'll be today. Open your Bibles there, please. Take one out of the rack. Use your app, whatever you're going to use. First, 2 Peter, first chapter 19 through 21. God said, pay attention. So for 2022, first, God says, Calvin, you've got to pay closer attention to my word. And second, you've got to teach your church members, teach the people, Sundays, Wednesdays, anytime, to pay closer attention to God's word. And so today, if we're going to look at this passage of scripture, we are going to take and learn why we are to pay attention to the Word of God, as I've titled the message. So if you have it, 2 Peter 1, 19-21, I'm going to read from the New American Standard Translation. Just follow along with me, please, as I read these three verses. Peter writes, so we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. May God bless the reading of his word. So, in these verses, Peter gives us three instructions to follow. The first one is, God's word, be interested in it. If I had more room, I think I would have put, be greatly interested in it. Why should we be interested in God's word? Isn't it just another book? No. This is your guidebook for life. This contains God's love letters 
to you. See, Peter writes there in the 19th verse, verse we have the prophetic word. Now, what does it mean by prophetic? He does not mean, well, people looked into a crystal ball and wrote this down. Or some spirit spoke to them and wrote this down. Prophetic has an understanding of a foretelling. Now, I'm going to be prophetic. If somebody gets out here on Hines Chapel Road, and they decide they're going to drive all the way down to Heiko at 100 miles an hour, I prophesy they're going to be in a wreck. If you agree, say amen. amen. If you disagree, say amen. Wow, you're, you're prophetic too. That's the understanding of what Peter's saying. It's not that God is saying, oh, I predict such and such is going to happen. What he's saying is, if you do this, this is going to be the end result. If you don't do this, this is going to be the end result. I mean, if you get out on 40, 85, and you decide you're going to drive 40 miles an hour, there's going to be an accident somewhere, right? Yep. That's what, how we need to look at the Bible. That's what Peter said. It's a prophetic word. Well, how are we to look at it? He says, it's made more sure and you need to pay attention. And so it's a light shining in a dark place. If you were here for the Christmas dinner, and we ended it with like a, a little candlelight service, turned off the light. Now, we didn't have it totally dark. But if everybody started to light a candle, it got brighter in there, didn't it, if you were there? Well, you see, as Christians, our light is to be the light of Christ in us. How do we light our light based on this? You can say, well, I believe Jesus is God's son. How do you believe that? It better be by this. Well, now, I had some preacher tell me that when I was 13 years old. Well, that's great. But he was preaching from this, hopefully. Our light, the source, is right here. And so we need to pay attention to it, because if we don't pay attention to it, our light's going to go out. It's going to be covered up. It'll be so dim, nobody's going to recognize it. And just think about our world. Is it getting darker? In my opinion, yes. Christians need to make more Christians so we can brighten things up. It's the only way, and I'll admit, this is my opinion. It's the only way by us following this, the world's going to change. There's too many people who are following the dark side. Whether they are alcoholics or drug addicts or in a gang or they just claim, well, I was abused growing up and so I don't know any better. They make any claim they want. The only thing that's going to change it is Christ and the only way they're here by is through the Word of God. So pay close attention greatly interested in it until the day dawns, the morning star, until Christ comes back, or maybe he arises in your heart. That's what Peter's telling us. Now, maybe you know this verse, Psalm 119, 105. Your word, the psalmist is talking about God's word, is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. When I read this verse, I always think about, is there a button on here to make it just like a flashlight? See, that's how we need to treat it. If your power goes off, it's totally dark. By the way, you know they're calling for snow tomorrow. Maybe three to four inches. Somewhere. <laughs> Alaska, maybe. Maine. But you never know. You might wake up and the power's off and the house is cold. I've had it happen. So what do you got to do? Well, you either light a candle or get a flashlight, right? So you can see where you're going. You're not bumping into walls. You're not tripping over the dog or whatever the case may be. It's a pathway of light. Here's your flashlight. All the answers are in it. Now, no, there is no index, at least I've not seen one yet, that you could turn to that says how to raise a child in their terrible coops. 
or to deal with a teenager, or I'm having marriage issues or financial issues. There's no index like that, but all the answers are in here. And so if we pay great attention to it, we will be able to lamp to our feet and the light to the pathway of life that we're on. That's what Peter's saying. And that's how we need to be greatly interested in God's word. Second instruction Peter gives is God's word has one interpretation. One interpretation. So what's an interpretation? Well, let's look at translations versus interpretation. Translation is to put into words of a different language. Now, as I said, I read from the New American Translation. Some of you may have King James translations or New King James translation or the New International translation. There's the American uh, um, Revised Standard. There's the uh, NIV, the English Standard. There's the, the Message, the Living Bible, the New Living Bible. If you have a computer and you go to BibleGateway.com, on that pull down, there's like 100 translations in English. It doesn't count Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, German, French. The Bible's been translated in all those languages. Think about Wycliffe Bible translators. What are they doing? They're trying to translate the Bible into a native language. Now, where are they translating from? Well, they're not translating from the King James Bible or the New American Bible. They're translating from the original languages. But understand this, we don't have the original copies. We don't have what Moses wrote. We don't even have Paul's letters. We have copies of all of them. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and a portion of Daniel, the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic. The New Testament is written in what's known as Greek or Koine Greek, common Greek. And so what we have, my New American Standard Translation, has been translated based on the original copies that we had into English. But to make it a little bit more complex, there's three ways that they translate. Because some translations are for like eight-year-olds. Others, which New American kind of falls into, more for college level reading. Now, most of us can read like an eight year uh, read an on an eight year old level. After that, some of us struggle. Okay? <laughs> just, just, I'm just confessing. But the New American, King James, and others are translated. Remember, you're going from one language to another in word for word. They look at their original language and say, okay, what is the closest word in the English to that word? But also understand, Greek has three main words they use for love. But each of those Greek words is translated into one word in English, love. It's not like, like a lot in love, it's love. Love. And also when translating, they have to take into consideration. They're not just translating from one language to another, one culture to another, one time period to another. Paul, in his writings, says women should have their heads covered. And I remember a day when most women came in with their hats on, had their heads covered. Maybe some of you did that. But see, that's a cultural thing because in Paul's day, any woman who did not have her head covered was a prostitute. So you can see why he said that. So you got word for word translated. Then there's thought for thought. That's the New International. They'll take and look at the rich and say, okay, well, here's the thought. They'll get the words close, but not exact. And last is what's known as a paraphrase. The message, living Bible, New Living. Those are paraphrase, which is where a person or persons Look at the original language and say, well, here's how I would say that. You know, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Paraphrase, God loved everybody, so he sent his son 
to die for you. You say it your way. So that's a translation. Then you have interpretation, which is the action of explaining the meaning of something. That's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to give you the interpretation of God's word. Now, I could stop two people on the way out today and say, would you interpret the service today? You're all going to have, you're all going to say it in your own way, but hopefully you'll say, well, we had hymns and singing and preaching and did the Lord's Supper. Something along that line. But you're going to say it your way. Now, somebody says, I don't remember the singing. Or you came in late. Your interpretation is going to be different, isn't it? Who's right, who's wrong? Well, when you read this, there's only one interpretation. God. God's interpretation. Not just my interpretation or your interpretation. And, and I, I had to do it twice this morning. People say, oh, Rick, you did a good job. I said, don't thank me, thank him. Because I don't want to give you my interpretation. I want to give you God's interpretation. I do my study, I do my work, and I've heard preachers that have taken portions of Scripture and twisted it to suit them. So if you don't read this and study it, you won't know if they're telling the truth or their own personal truth. If you catch me off, let me know. Because I don't want to teach you Calvin's truth. I want to teach you God's truth. God is the only one who can give an interpretation. Now, why is that? Well, God's Word. It's one story from beginning to end. One author. God's the author. It has one interpretation, not multiple. It has one meaning, not multiple. And one theme. The theme is redemption. It has one hero, the Lord Jesus. One villain, the devil. And one purpose, the glory of God. Now, if you disagree with me, let's talk. You think about it. I don't care if you go to Leviticus or one of the Gospels or Revelation. Jesus is the hero. The devil's the villain. But it's all to give glory to God. Every book, every chapter is good. So, Peter says, be interested. No one only has one interpretation because God's word is an inspired writing. He says that in verse 21, or 20, 20 and 21. Uh, scriptures a matter of no one's own interpretation. 20, for no prophecy foretelling of what's going to take place was ever made by an act of human will. No man ever said, hey, I think I'm going to write. Peter didn't wake up and say, you know what? I'm going to write a letter, a second letter to Christians around. No. Nope. He was inspired to write by God. What do I mean by inspired? Motivated, encouraged, led. No, God didn't dictate. God didn't say, okay, Peter, I want you to write these words. God inspired every author from Moses to John, Genesis to Revelation to write down. There's a few spots. We see it in Revelation where God tells John, John, write. There's a couple of others. But for the most part, people like Peter were inspired to write. Well, how can God be the author? Because God inspired them to write in their own manner. Just like if I was to ask everybody to write a paragraph about this service, nobody's going to write the exact same thing. You're going to say it your way. But God led each one to write it down their way to what he wanted. As I said, some of these prophets, Isaiah said some things concerning the prophecy of the Messiah, the coming Christ. I don't think he realized what he was saying. But I think he wrote down, he said what God wanted. He was inspired to write. Believe me. 
A Sunday has not gone by where I get up here and I say something that I feel God wants me to say that I hadn't planned on saying. Is that an inspired? Sure, I would look at it. Though. Parallel verse to this one in 2nd Second Peter. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where he says all scripture is inspired by God, and that includes Old Testament and New Testament. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training, all in righteousness, God's righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, doesn't say exceeding, just adequate, and equipped for every good And that's what the Bible does for us. It can correct us and reprove us. It can also train us how to live righteously. God will equip us through his word. Now, let me just add this a little bit about the word of God. A little bit of history. Somebody didn't just say, okay, here's the Old Testament, here's the New Testament. The Old Testament was, and both of them, what's been done to is known as being canonized. Quote, a group of learned men around or by 135 AD said, okay, what we call the Old Testament is closed. There's no more scriptures from God. Around 400 AD, a group of learned men, religious leaders that knew the Word of God, said the New Testament is closed. No more additions. Now, there were plenty of other writings that could have been included, but these men said, no, they don't belong in the Scriptures, the Word of God. Because all scripture is inspired by God, and for whatever reason they had, and I could list a few, but I'm not going into that detail. They said, no, this one doesn't belong. This is it. And so God's word is canonized. It's closed. So, we're to pay close attention to God's word. You may recall back in 1948, or have heard about it, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. They are the oldest known copy of the Old Testament. Now, they don't have every book. I think Esther's missing. And, you know, they're, they were a few hundred years old, shall we say. And so some of the copies, the scrolls that they found, had deteriorated. So it's like, you know, a, a verse or two was missing in some of the copies. But when they compared them, to newer copies, there's only minor differences. You know, a period here, a comma here, the word and, A-N in this one, the word and, A-N-D in this one. The meaning was not changed by any meaning. So what's that tell us? Because God, I said, oh, we have our copies. We don't have the originals. What that tells us God made sure his word stayed the same. There is what's known, it was written sometime in the early 2000 B.C. It's known as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. It's kind of like the flood story of Noah. And they have copies of it, more than one, maybe a dozen. But they're hundreds of years in age apart. This one contains this, but it's not in this one. And this one contains this, and it's not in this one. God's word stays the same. It does not change. Man might change it. It can be translated differently, but there's only one interpretation for it. You know, I've seen... Uh, Television shows that I grew up watching, maybe the movies or they remake them, they're totally different. God's word stays the same. Why? Well, that's a reason for us to pay close attention to it, what he likes. So, when 
it comes to God's word, be interested, very interested in God's word. Because it has one interpretation, God's interpretation. Because it is an inspired, motivated, encouraged by God writing. It is for us, our benefit, if you will. Which is why for 2022, I want all of us to pay closer attention to each passage that I cover on Sundays as well as Wednesdays because the Bible is God's love letter to you. It's your instruction book for life. Use it as a guide for your life at whatever age. Teach it to your children, your grandchildren, your, your siblings, your, your, your uh, nephews and nieces, your neighbor's kids. Teach it to everybody. This is to be our guide for life. So we can point people to Christ. We come back on Wednesday, we're going to talk about, we'll get it in chapter 6 and talk about the rapture. Because the tribulation period, well, my only true answer I can give is we're a day closer to it today than we were yesterday. It could happen today, it may not happen for another 10,000 years, but it will happen. My desire, our desire, needs to be to take as many people to heaven with us as possible. But we can't do that if we don't pay attention to this. And I hope by the time we reach the end of Revelation, you're ready to say, I'm ready to go, and I want to take as many people as possible because nobody should have to go through that tribulation. close this portion. We're going to take part in the Lord's Supper in a minute in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Fathers, we just come before you. Lord, you gave us your word. You gave it to us. It's been analyzed and picked over, and there are plenty of people who want to argue points, but we must accept it as being written by various authors, but all because you wanted them to write it. Father God, remind me every day to pay closer attention to your word. Help me to take this congregation, this church, to where we're all paying closer attention to your word. Because I know the day's coming. I see things that I see in your word that at one point I don't understand how it could have happened, but now I can. Inspire all of us, God, that we would point as many people as we possibly can to your word, as I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, Jesus also gave us something else that we can take. gave us the Lord's Supper or communion that we can take and pay attention to him. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So what he's saying is, pay close attention. Pay close attention to what I've done and what I've said. So at this time, I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. While they do that, I'm going to read a portion of Scripture out of 1 Corinthians that Paul writes concerning the Lord's Supper. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pay attention. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me say this before we partake. First off, 
Yes, we are to remember Jesus went to the cross. He was scourged. He died and God the Father raised him from the grave for forgiveness of our sins. We must remember that. But also as the end of that scripture points out, he promises to come again one day. Doesn't matter how dark his world may get, how bright we try and shine our lights, he's going to return. The other part is this is a time not just to remember Christ, but it's only for those who have confessed Christ as Lord and Savior. You don't have to be a church member, but you have to be a believer. If you've never confessed your faith in Christ, let the cup and the bread pass by. Because then what you're doing is you're saying, God can't forgive my sins that you have unconfessed. And if you have unconfessed sins in your life, bow your head and tell them to God and ask him for forgiveness. Because you confess, he forgives that sin. Would you say blessing over the bread as the scriptures say they do? Heavenly Father, we come to you today as we go through this communion service. We just ask you to bless us and bless this bread that we all might know without a doubt what this bread Jesus' words, this is my body which has been broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, they took the cup. Blessing over the cup. I just finally. 